Hi there, my name is Emily Wright. I am the creator of It'll Be All Right. Today I will be presenting an experiment called the 100 Days of Color, which is looking at the relationship between subconscious and algorithmic bias in the Spotify program and looking at how it influences the recommendations given to users. This began in 2020 after the race riots when I was inspired to check myself and discovered that over 95% of the music that I was listened to it was made by white artists. This surprised me because I'd never taken in to account the race of the people that I listened to. And I understood that this high white trend resulted because of feedback loops where the program was recommending music based on my history and I was using the recommendations to find new music. So I wanted to design an experiment to see how much influence users have in, in equity online. So the idea of this experiment is that through my unconscious habits, the program was recommending more white artists than black. So through my conscious actions, I wanted to see if I could get the program to recommend more black artists than white. I felt that if I could flip this trend, then it would mean that it is entirely the user's fault if there is this trend. And it is therefore the user's responsibility to ensure equity online. However, if I was not able to create this shift, then that would mean there's something else in the programming itself that is preventing artists of color from gaining the same exposure. I want to note that I was looking at this in a black and white lens at the beginning of the experiment, but that does change over time. In the experiment, the idea was to flood the program with colorful data and see how it responded. So for the first 100 days of the experiment, I would listen to the discography of a new or a few new artists each day, and then I would pick one song to add to a playlist called The 100 Days of Color, which I designed as a story ahead of time, and it was designed as a flow. So you listen to it from the top the first time round. I deliberately didn't search for black artists or black music anywhere online because I understand that it's all connected and I didn't want to create a phase shift in my program where it was highlighting artists of color because it thought that I wanted that based on my search history. I wanted to create a sustainable shift so I could get the program to permanently give more diverse options. When it came to collecting the data, once a week, I would record the racial demographics of my six daily mixes, my release radar, and my discover weekly. And then I did it again after 100 days and then the 200th day. So after 100 days of colorful input, I did 100 days of new habits where I went back to listening whatever I wanted to listen to and then see how it responded again. I originally intended to take the data every single week throughout the whole 100 days. However, I, there were just too many ethical implications to racial profiling and I couldn't continue after the first six weeks. I began with just splitting between black, white and other because again I was looking at this in the black white lens. On the sixth week I switched to the racial demo the racial definitions provided by the United States Office of Management and Budget which were last updated in 1997 but I found that these were not practical ways of categorizing us. I found it very ineffective. And so I eventually switched to this here and I used these five skin tones to group the artists in my playlist. This here is the overall data for my experiment. So each pie chart represents a playlist. These are also listed in what I call a convenience hierarchy, where the playlists at the top are the most convenient because they're the first ones you see in the made for you shelf, which was the structure at the start of this playlist, where daily mix one and two were the first thing you see, but release radar and discover weekly, you had to scroll across to a few times, which meant if you were in a rush, you're more likely to click daily mix one and two than anything else. And if you'll notice here, you'll see that Daily Mix 1 is almost entirely white. But then after this dotted line on there, it jumps a lot and everything changes and becomes much more diverse.
This is because I cleared out the liked songs playlist where I deleted about a thousand songs. And I realized that there's a former version of the programming based on my understanding that they, once upon a time, if you liked an album, it would add it to your entire liked songs. It, the entire album would be added to your liked songs playlist. But after they changed the programming, it no longer does this. So the older your music is, the more weight it has because if an, an album is basically double weighted. It's in your music library and it's in your light songs playlist. So I saw a dramatic change there. I also created staggered pie charts just to visualize this convenience hierarchy in a different way with daily mix one, the most convenient playlist being on the outside. As you move into the smaller circles, they get less convenient. So that's what this looks like here. Uh, you're welcome to come and have a look at this on another time. Um, I was very curious about how Spotify designed their playlists, and I came across a concept called algatorial filtering, which is basically a combination of human and computer input, where the humans will provide the base songs for playlists, but the program will select a few of those songs for each individual user based on their history. So the idea is everyone can access the same playlist, but it looks different for everyone else. I thought this was really cool, but then I came across a playlist called Radar Canada. And in the description, it said handpicked by our curators. And this caught my eye because I was understanding that it was through this filtering process that I was getting most of my recommendations. But this Radar Canada playlist was basically raw data where it was just straight from the humans. And I monitored these guys for, I collected the data four times and it looks like this. And as you can see, there's a trend here. And these really caught my attention because I'd been seeing this trend elsewhere. I collected all of the playlist pie charts from my first six weeks and grouped them together with the Radar Canada playlists. And you can kind of see that this trend is following through. So I realized that I could make a prediction. And this prediction was to the racial demographic of Spotify because the curators set the baseline of the recommendations. They provide the program with all of the core content. Curators will only ever recommend music that you like, and you like music that you relate to, and you relate to it because it's representative of who you are, which means the music that you listen to is representative of who you are. And with this understanding, I felt that I could make a prediction that the racial demographic of Spotify looks like this. So after making this prediction, I did some investigating into the Spotify website and discovered that they provide their ethnicity data for the United States online. I then created pie charts of these and they look like this. When you compare my prediction and the official data that is provided on the Spotify website as to their ethnicity in the United States, they look like this. So by monitoring the way the algorithms recommended music based on race, I was able to correctly identify the racial demographic of the people who programmed the algorithms. I call this the curator trap, where the program can only ever give recommendations as good as the music that it was originally given. So this is kind of a flow that I demonstrated here, just showing how each people design a set amount of playlists and music, and then the program can only ever use the music it's been given. So where else can we see this? We've seen this pattern in facial recognition software as well. And facial recognition software as also uses convolutional neural networks. So Spotify uses this too. Um, it's a system of, of filtering to identify audio and visuals. Um, so basically there is nothing that's exempt from algorithmic bias in all of our online digital existence. So algorithmic bias, the way I see it, is a digitized version of subconscious bias. So in order for us to address our algorithmic bias, we also need to address subconscious bias in tandem. So we need to set up a system of checks and balances so that others can, other people can hold us 
accountable for the subconscious biases that we don't realize that we have in order to get into a position that we can do that that everybody needs to be empowered so that they can use their voice and speak up and everyone needs to have the resources so they can get the education that they need so they can step into positions that combat algorithmic bias uh, thank you for listening, everybody. If you'd like to get in contact with me, there's some links here. I've also written a book about all of this called The 100 Days of Color, Celebrating Frequentic Beauty, which also discusses, discusses the psychology of discrimination. Keep an eye out for that. Um, also, please feel free to check out the playlist called The 100 Days of Color on Spotify. It is a story designed as a flow, um, so listen to it from the top the first time round. Uh, thank you all for listening, and feel free to give me a shout.